Aris Anagnostopoulos. He is a social anthropologist and historian. He works, among other places, with the Heritage Management Organization. And Aris will be talking about the transition from Turkopolis to Metropolis, transforming, transforming urban boundaries in late 19th century Heraklion. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I will gallop through my presentation because we're running short of time. So um, this uh, presentation today is um, my claim that uh, the, the period of transition from, from part of Ottoman Empire to autonomous state in Crete, um, pre-existing notions of social boundaries solidified as borders between communities in space. Uh, this process was part and parcel with a continuous definition and redefinition of notions of ethnic community as a population. Um, so this was not a precipitous transformation, but the crystallization of processes that were in place throughout the 19th century. So the idea of the border, of course, you may all know, I'm not adding anything new here, that uh, it is a dividing line, the idea of a dividing line that can be traced with accuracy on a map. Uh, it aims to regulate movement across the border, but it also is a re prerequisite of the border that there is freedom and right of movement within what, within what is enclosed in the border. So a sense of homogeneous territorial space. Of course, the border as a notion, but also more importantly, as a mode of governmentality, of governing populations, is of course associated with the territorial national state um, but it is not only an effect of this nationalizing tendency as of larger developments in the techniques of population shaping description and control in the 19th and 20th century. Um, today, and this is important for us anthropologists when we're looking back at historical uh, periods, when we discuss negotiable boundaries, we still think of ethnic groups, uh, for example, as localized units, as enclosed uh, spheres of activity, touching upon different spheres along a clear line of division, which may be undulating, fluctuating, or somewhat permeable, but it remains spatially restrictive. Um, this is, of course, an epistemological issue having to do with accepted knowledge and traditions of research, but it is also an effect of the archive itself. Um, in fact, the very perceptions through which we understand communities and boundaries in the past um, and the uh, relationships between communities were an historical sediment of the shift to modernity. Um, okay, in, in other words, modernity in Crete, for example, was accompanied by a, by a selective creation and destruction of sources and monuments which could be said to constitute the, art, the archive that we visit today. Um, so when we examine social boundaries in the city, we are looking through the representation, representations of these boundaries created through the autonomous regime, and mostly uh, by Christian Cretans and their representations of uh, Cretan Muslims. So what we can do, therefore, and what we do, instead of looking for the truth behind boundaries in the city, is to look at those discursive formations, those formations of speech and action, of thought and action, that made it possible to think about borders between communities and about communities as bounded entities in space. Um, so let us see an example of how this redrawing came about, this vision of uh, bounded communities in space. This is a map produced by the sanitary offices of the occupying British army in Heraklio. Um, the British were stationed in the city for a good eight years, from the blockade of 1898 to 1906. They were there as part of the great powers occupation of the island, which was a measure taken to finally resolve the Cretan question at the beginning, end of 19th century, beginning of 20th. Um, of course, diplomatic and political history too complex to present here, but the point I want to make in this map is that it shows precisely how an older scheme of urban existence was unreadable by the colonial administration of the time. Um, simply stated, there was no map of the city. No one could map the, the old medieval Ottoman city. Um, the British authorities could not see what was there, the meandering streets, because it was, there was no city plan at the time we were talking about. The cartographer there sees only lines, 
edges of buildings or neighborhoods and draws borders on the map. It is quite a different mode of thinking than a prevailing, than a prevailing local one, which is evidence in the sources. Um, where plots of land were measured according to use value, communally preserved boundaries, and not according to surface and precisely drawn borders. A similar vision that occluded the flows of movements of people into neatly parceled uh, ethnic populations is re represented in this map drawn in ethnographic account, an ethnographic account of the era. It is only an example of the many ethnic maps of Crete that uh, were produced in the from the middle to the uh, late 19th century. This is from Ethnographie de la Turquie d'Europe, pardon my French, by Guillaume Lejean. This is an 1861 um, map. Uh, in these maps, it's, it's interesting that this map is based on a, on a, travelogue, on a travelogue, a traveler's account, Pashley's account of a travel in, uh, in Crete, and um, a, a census that Pashley made by uh, moving from district to district. Uh, Lejean takes this um, information and transforms it into this uh, neatly drawn areas of uh, Muslim and uh, Christian uh, communities. What is interesting is the color that uh, Lejean uh, uh, uses in this uh, description, which is a color that was kept throughout the later part of the 19th century, blue for Christians, red for Muslims. Um, okay, this is a map, unfortunately, it's not very well reproduced here because it's a reproduction of a reproduction. Um, I think this mode of thinking about spe spatially bound communities is reflected in the way the British tried to intervene in 1898 in the intercommunal strife that had ensued after the last Christian revolt of 1895. Again, a time where uh, intercommunal relationships were very tense and you could actually speak about, you could talk about uh, you know, separate communities in space. So during this revolt, what usually happened in revolts took place. The Christians of the city uh, left the, um, the city, fled to the countryside. The Turkish army did not or could not venture out that frequently or went to Greek ports of the Aegean. The Muslims of the rural hinterland uh, swarmed into the city in their thousands. Um, the British were forced to have the idea of introduce this cordon, which is a, a line, a, a fictitious line on the map, that um, it's a guarded border around the city, roughly corresponding to the province of Topalti, um, and order the various chiefs of the two ethnic groups under their influence to respect this line as a frontier between them. Um, it's interesting here to look at the colors representing the cordon in this map. Red is for Muslims, blue is for Christians, once again. Um, so where can we see a difference with a local sort of thinking about boundaries? If I were asked to distinguish such a mode of thinking from the sources, it would have been based on movement and spatial densities. Uh, so I propose a different reading of the extant sources of late 19th, early 20th century Heraklion in order to show that boundaries between people were based on two interconnected processes or features. One was the flows of people and things within and without the city, and the other process or feature was that there were places within the city that concentrated these flows um, in increased densities. Okay, as an example of... Uh, the passage, the hybridity between a notion of fluid um, movements in space and densities, uh, boundaries based on movement, and a notion of borders as fixed line in space, we could look at early attempts uh, at map making or representing the city. Um, once the British occupied the city of uh, Kandy, of Heraklion, they immediately pressed for sanitary reform. This, of course, was part and parcel of their colonialist techniques and discourses of civilization, especially since the city was in a state that some officials terms, termed at the time a humanitarian disaster. There were some 40 or 50,000 Muslim refugees swarming the city when the city in times of peace could afford a population of maximum 10,000 in total. Sewers were bursting, garbage was lying about everywhere, dead animals in the street, scavenger dogs and vermin were feeding off refuse and dead animals. The stench of the city was unbearable and epidemics were breaking out. The British 
um, one of the first measures that the British pressed towards was the creation of a city plan. So they, they pressed the, um, the municipal authorities to make a city plan, which was later known, it was the first city plan of Iraqian, it was known as the British plan, although the Greek uh, engineers made it. Um, and this was in order to be able to administer the city in a more scientific uh, and more civilized terms. Um, what is remarkable is that the sanitary divisions of the city, while based on Western ideas and techniques of governmentality, preserved existing senses of urban space. Um, this is a paragraph from the municipal order setting up the garbage collection scheme that was instituted by the British. The city was divided in four large districts, like so. So these are the four districts that the British could see. And then the municipality um, uh, divided the city in 11 sections that kept the four administrative sections and in a way accommodating between a more practical bottom-up perception of the city and a top-down administrative one. What is interesting in the 11 sections uh, outlined here, some of which are outlined here, um, they, they corresponded only roughly to local neighborhoods. Uh, but not exactly, since it was still then impossible to define the borders of a neighborhood in exact terms. So we don't see a neighborhood organization scheme. The description instead was based on the trajectory of the muleteers collecting garbage within the city. So we, we are actually uh, reading a description of a walk, of a ride rather, in the city. So from Kora Kasteke down to the house of Abdurrahman Herimetakis, etc., etc. So these represent, in a way, ideational maps of walking around the city. Um, and I claim they could not do, they could not represent this as a neighborhood organization because neighborhoods were not bounded, delineated, drawn, cartographic spaces, but spaces conceived both, both as material places and networks of loyalties. Um, we see, by the way, we see the same effect of these uh, spaces de delineated, uh, evoked by movement or trajectories within the cities in uh, memoirs and reminiscences of the city that were later composed by contemporaries. Um, they were also based on this narrative form of listing features, shops, for example, as one, the writer mentally followed the street they were placed at. So we have lists of, uh, of shops, for example, as the writer remembered walking in a particular street, down and then up. Um, also, most local stories about ethnic differences and attempts to settle them begin with the trope of the hero of the story bravely passing, walking through, uh, an ethnically different area, uh, you know, a prohibited, uh, bounded off, sealed area. Now, um, the other uh, process or feature that was there was that there were places within the city that concentrated these flows of movement in increased densities, and they produced different, differential geographies of agglomeration, which could be associative or exclusionary. For example, market streets with specific shops, for example, metallurgy, haberdashery, grocery stores, that could be frequented by people of both creeds, or conversely, low-life neighborhood cafes that decent folk had to avoid. Densities could also, be create, could also be created in a vertical sense, from a place within a neighborhood and up. For example, in petitions we have in the, in the archive, uh, petitions to the mayor signed by both Muslim and Christians, but also horizontally across spaces, as an example in petitions signed by a particular trade, example bakers. Um, however, as the imagining of the city changed towards a cartographic sense of bordering, these hubs or densities changed as imaginary places. They were no longer the denser nodes of a network of movements and flows, but became indexes of spatially bounded entities or neighborhoods in the new sense of the term. Uh, of course, this was a process that involved a massive reconfiguration of political power and ethnic religious loyalties in a volatile political climate of opposition. And it's not only part of the urban planning initiative. Um, an example I wish to make of this is the, um, 
the seafront plazas of a neighborhood, an area called Kizil Dabia, uh, which is the, the red bastion here. It's the western, northwestern uh, area of the city of Heraklio. Um, these were plazas in the, uh, the, the seafront, uh, this seafront area with disreputable <coughs> coffee shops. Uh, they were located in the western, the poorer industrial neighborhoods of the city where most of the Muslim refugees settled down when they entered the city. They had an extensive network of uh, coffee shops, brothels, corner shops and baths that were associated with the lower strata of the city in the eyes of the administrator. Um, these were spatial hubs where male bravery and virility were paramount in shaping relations of hierarchy and power. In an, order, in an older regime of Cretan irredentism, such bravery uh, was an element of Christian Cretan identity that was loaded by Greek public discourses and was, was supported in economic and military terms, of course, for Christians only. As the regime changed, however, during the autonomous year, years, discourses altered significantly, significantly and this male prowess became problematic to the new polity. Simultaneously, the presence of the British colonial forces dressed this irredentist civilizing discourse with their own sanitary practice and ideology. Captain Clark, the officer responsible for health and sanitation of the British troops, reflects the moral alarm the state of this neighborhood of Kizil Dabia um, caused to British eyes. And of course, lays it squarely on the newcomers, Muslim peasants that were in a destitute condition. They lived in misery and filth. Um, they fell victims to epidemics of all kinds. One can easily imagine the wretched conditions of, affair, of affairs which existed among the population, many thousands above the normal number. Um, now, the response to these um, discourses by the Christian bourgeois of the city can be summed up in this letter, okay, uh, extract of a letter written by Amabile Itar, who was a lo local doctor of Italian descent, um, in, in which letter he blames the, uh, the condition of the city to the, the, the unsanitary condition of uh, Muslims, to the fact that they are Bektashis, uh, which dis uh, a sect that dispenses with the precept of prayer. So Bektashis basically do not wash, so they're more, even more, they're dirtier than uh, Muslims who wash all day according to uh, uh, Amabile Itar. And uh, so, therefore, after the arrival of um, uh, Muslim peasants from the country into the city, the city was turned into a vast cloaca and center of infection, a vast sewer. Um, okay, Itar here contrasts in cultural terms the perceived unhealthiness of the Ottoman city to the sanitary civilized comportment of the British and, of course, their emulators, the Christian bourgeois. Um, this, these discourses were put to practice very effectively in isolating specific neighborhoods, especially those near the port, and especially Kizil Tavia, and present them as example of unhealthy uh, environments uh, owing to the Muslim presence there. So this another, um, rather an article in the Epistemos Ephemeris Discritiquis Politias, the uh, official newspaper, the, that there were scientific observations conducted by the military doctor of the British occupying army, Mr. Clark, with the city doctor, Mr. Mercatatis, uh, relating to the causes of swamp fever, and surprise, surprise, the, um, the fevers were attributed to um, the neighborhoods near the military barracks of the English in Kizil Dabia, Hania Gate, and Pigadia. Um, this is the military barracks of the, one, one part of these barracks, the first actually barracks that were set up near the port, and Kizil Dabia is immediately uh, below it. Um, so it was incidental that the uh, British um, turned their attention to this neighborhood and they pinpointed the source of pollution to Kizil Dabia. Um, at the same time, local discourses capi capitalized on these practices by presenting the place, the place Kizil Dabia, as both dirty and dangerous to the, mor the morals of Christians. So um, the three places, uh, the three plazas of Kizil Dabia with its Turkey, 
Turkish, Turkish coffee shops and low ceiling one room houses in between piles of garbage in its narrow alleys and its broken sewers here and there and the sewage pooling in the cavities of its stone paved streets. This area, Kizil Dabia and the, uh, the area of the western part of the city near the port was known in, uh, and is still in a way known in Iraqlian as Berbat Mahala. Um, okay, it's a wordplay, it's not uh, I think correct Turkish. Um, it's a wordplay for Greek speakers which confuses the Turkish word berbat, dangerous, with the Italian word uh, birbante, berbadis, which means uh, morally, sexually promiscuous, whereas the uh, Turkish word actually means dangerous. Dangerous, morally uh, damaging neighborhoods. Um, and this was a, a word that was pointing to the concentration of Muslim brothels in the area of Kizil Dabia. So Kizil Dabia, in um, this public campaign of moral panic, was portrayed um, as uh, dirty and dangerous because of inherent Muslim cultural traits. And the solidification of such bounded space as metaphors, as uh, examples of Muslim neighborhoods at large, was a one-sided process that had to do with the final victory of Christian wealthy professional classes. Um, at the same time, stories developed where the Christian strongmen, the only ones who could venture in such dangerous spaces, were reinserted into a nationalist um, narrative. These stories had a lot to do with all their notions of uh, boundary keeping, but reread through the light of irredentity struggle as operations that solidified borders between already established communities of blood. Filetikes was the contemporary word, usually quali qualified as a characteristic of enmity, for example, filetika apathy. And with this, I conclude my presentation. Thank you very much.